Okay, so thank you, Stephanie, for the um, introduction. Um, right now, uh, the farm is getting ready for the busy season. It usually starts around March, uh, March 1st to about September 15th. During that time, we raise between three and 5,000 butterflies a week. After that, uh, the slow season starts and it's about five to 700 uh, butterflies a week. So we've been doing this for about 34 years. Um, it's been a long ride, a good ride, and I'd like to share the farm with you. So I guess we'll go ahead and get started. So Larry, um, and Larry's been watching this whole process for about 20, 25 years and seen us grow and see it grow. So um, I appreciate that, Larry, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So we'll do the next picture. That's just the entrance to the farm. Um, we actually have uh, maximum uh, solar cells there. Half of the uh, office is um, run by um, solar cells, so that's pretty good. Um, we'll go into the next picture. So that's just an overhead view. This is, picture was taken about five years ago. I would say that um, uh, it's, it's pretty pretty up to date there. Um, we did add some more plants to the back property. Um, currently, I think we have about 50,000 plants. Um, takes a lot to breed a lot of butterflies. Uh, every cage has to be enclosed because if the butterfly, if it's female butterflies flying around and they're laying eggs everywhere, it gets out of control. That's why you see screens over the uh, cages. And each one, um, you know, holds different plants for different species of butterflies. It's all about the plants. Um, if you don't have the plant, you're not going to be able to raise the butterfly. So we spend a lot of time getting the plants and, and uh, keeping the process going. All right, next picture. Okay, this is just a picture of the a diorama of the farm. Um, and you can see a bunch of butterflies on there. And what we try to show in this picture or this uh, um, presentation is wherever you see that uh, species of butterfly is a plant that we're um, growing to um, raise that species. Uh, so you'll see, I think, 15 different species in this picture. To the right uh, is where we do a little tram ride. Okay, but right now, um, you can go to the next picture. That's fine. Go ahead, Larry. Okay, good, right there. So. We have two white cages there, and that's where um, some of our bigger flight areas are. Uh, we bring the kids in there and, and show them the different, um, you know, way they fly and this and that. Uh, we focus on the left one more of um, the zebra longwing or state butterfly because it, it, it flies so well and, and puts on a great show for the kids. The one to the right there is mainly for swallowtails and monarchs. However, we will do um, spice fish swallowtail, any, any kind of big swallowtail we'll, we'll raise in there. And then the other cages, you know, just food, food, food. Uh, and you'll see some of these pictures as we go along. All right, next. Uh, the, the one with the two butterflies, we call it the, the war zone. So every day we get you know, the eggs and you know, some, some species, We'll breed outdoors, some are indoors, but we breed probably 75% uh, indoors. So in there, it's very, very intense. Right now, um, you know, we're under a lot of pressure uh, to produce the butterflies for next week and, and the rest of the, uh, the year. So container-wise, you'll see some of these containers, um, with probably about, about 250 containers when it's um, going full blast. We'll have three breeders breeding um, pretty much from about six hours a day. Uh, okay, that's the zebra longwing. That's the cage that we were talking about before. And the butterfly is laying its eggs on Suberosa. It's, it's laying its eggs on passion vines. There's all kinds of passion vines. Um, I think there's like 120 different species. This is Suberosa, or you call corky stem. And the zebras are very specific where they lay their eggs at the very end of the tendrils, um, the little yellow dots. And the funny thing, or the crazy thing is, if, let's say you had a a hundred passion vine uh, underneath shade, or just one underneath shade, and you had a hundred passion vine in an open field where sunlight's totally there. 
chances are they're going to lay all their eggs on that passion vine that's underneath shade. They just like to do that. Also, um, this butterfly, okay, that's good. There you can see it's intense. This is about 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, they're really getting ready to lay a bunch of eggs. And if you have the species in your backyard, they tend to go to sleep in the same spot every night. It's really neat to watch. Uh, yeah, that's a good picture there. Um, and it's a lot of fun. We hand the cup around to the kids um, so they can hold and, and watch this uh, process. Okay, next. Uh, there's a great picture there. Uh, we can go back um, if you can. Great. You can see the eggs. And yeah, that's a nice female right there. You know, they can produce about 200 eggs. And usually in the butterfly, uh, when they're laying eggs, the first batch are going to be great. The middle batch will be, you know, also really good. It's that last batch of eggs that we start to have problems with. And that's with any species. So you want to make sure you, you um, watch your egg laying and, and you can see problems when they, and when they happen. Uh, so that's a good butterfly right there. There's one another one laying there. Uh, the females of this butterfly, even when they're in the chrysalis stage, the male sometimes will mate while it's still in the chrysalis, which is, is crazy. Um, yeah, and they're long living. They can live up to a month. Um, so it's good, it's good. It's the Heliconius family. Go ahead, Larry. Did you have a question? Okay. Yeah, okay. This is giant swallowtail, and they're mating females on top, males on the bottom. Um, yeah, it, it, sometimes they can stay in this uh, for a day. A lot of species, some species, you know, a couple seconds. This one, a little bit longer, obviously. Uh, monarchs, too, can, can mate for a long time. That's the egg of the giant swallowtail. Uh, beautiful eggs. That's um, wild lime that it's laying on. Uh, they lay on citrus. Uh, we use wild lime because it doesn't get the leaf miner. Literally every leaf they can eat. Uh, it's a slow growing plant. And the, the problem with this plant is, I mean, I love it. I love it to death, but it, you can see the spines there. And as a, if you start feeding a lot of it and like, you know, doing hundreds at a time, uh, it, can, it can be a really challenging uh, task in breeding the butterfly, the caterpillar, because you're getting poked all the time. But that's a great, great uh, a plant. I mean, definitely, if you want to get egg laying, that's the way to go with that species. On a good day, we'll get two or three, maybe, you know, at least two or 300 eggs. If we have maybe 10, 20 females flying around. So, Julia, uh, butterfly, it's a South Florida butterfly. That's a male right there, um, just hanging out on a penta plant. Great flying butterfly. Exhibits want to see butterflies that fly. Um, so Z uh, Julia's do really, all the ones you're going to see on these, these things, uh, these slides do really well. Some species like the tiger swallow, okay, the tala, this, this butterfly was almost extinct. Uh, this is on a penta plant, great little butterfly. Um, we have an almond bush in our big flight area. And, you know, over the years we've had, you know, two or 300 uh, talas flying in there. And they all land on the almond bush. And then you shake the tree and they all fly out about 15 feet and come back. It's a lot of fun. And I think you're going to see some more pictures of this, but they, they're, they will eat, um, get some nectar off fruit. Um, you'll see how we do the apples and stuff like that. It feeds on kunti. There's the caterpillar right there. Really cool. What's amazing, which is hard to believe, but it's the smallest butterfly we raise and it takes the longest to produce. They can stay in the larval stage for three weeks or even longer in the wintertime. And then when they form their chrysalis, they don't do it, you know, like the other ones. It's a two day process. And then it takes, you know, another day to harden up. And then we can, if we, if we control it, we can make that butterfly hatch out a month later. But uh, yeah, it takes the longest for any of the species we have. There, there's some right there, they're getting ready to pop out. You can see the, the coloration of the wings uh, on top. These are all gonna pop out today. Uh, you'll know the night before, you'll see the eyeballs are black and then it, it changes overnight. Great little butterfly, that's a kunti right there. And it's, you know, uh, the, plant, the plant takes a long time to grow. That's, that's another problem with that, that species. Um, and if, you, if the larvae eat the entire plant, chances are you're going to lose it. So it's, it's really critical that you don't let them eat every single leaf. 
Okay, next. All right, this is um, some collards. This, the farm has a lot of hydroponics on it. Um, so in this particular setup, uh, the, there's no soil. There's, um, um, you can use uh, coconut fiber, perlite. Um, we have done some pots with soil in it. I think some of these have soil in them and we switch it over, but this is hydro, this is how it's set up. Uh, this, this area right here takes about, um, we, we give about two or three minutes for the uh, uh, fertilizer to go through. Um, yeah, this is called Georgia collards we use. They're, they're really good. There's all kinds of collards, you, you know, you wanna make sure you get the right one. And they eat a lot. This is for the great Southern white. And they have other species of plants that they'll eat, but uh, we choose to use this. This will die out, um, I believe. It may, probably in June, we'll have a hard time keeping alive the, the collars. Okay, next. There's just a smaller one right there. Um, getting ready to pop out, you know, the, the plants are coming out. You, there's some eggs. They lay in clusters, the great southern whites. If you ever see eggs, like they were just spread out, chances are they're not gonna make it. When they're laid like this, uh, yes, they're, they're gonna make it. And it, that's about the average size uh, of number of um, eggs will lay. You know, sometimes it'll be more, sometimes less, but at least, you know, that's, that's about an average or, or a little bit less. And they wanna lay on fresh leaves. There's a, that's a male, gray southern white. That's a beautiful male. Um, yeah, um, there's a pheromone on the, on these butterflies. So the female, when it first emerges, doesn't have that uh, smell, you know, and you can smell it a good distance away. But once it mates, mates, it has the pheromone and I don't know if it pushes them away or whatever, but that's what you know. So you, you could hold that butterfly two feet away, the female and smell it, yeah. Now, this is a tough butterfly to raise because um, there's a lot of predators, lizards especially, they'll, they'll go after these immediately. It's the first butterfly they go after. So um, we're always gonna watch out for lizards. Okay, next. Okay, this is Aristolochia from Viata. This is a python. There's all kinds of pythons who raise the polydemus and the python swallowtails here in central Florida. This one will, will raise both. It doesn't have the tendrils, so it doesn't climb. It's a low lying plant. Um, but if you can get it to take off, um, it's, a, it's great for egg, egg laying, um, you know, cool little flowers and stuff. Uh, when I first bought the seeds, oh my gosh, probably 20 years ago, it was a dollar nine, I think it was a dollar 15 uh, per seed. So it's kind of, it's kind of a rare plant. Um, uh, it doesn't grow as fast as most of the python that we have, but, but we have it on hand. I think we have three different uh, species of python. This is just one of them. Okay, next. Okay, this is a giant milkweed and it's blooming right here. From what I understand, um, um, we've, we've raised giant milkweed a lot for the last you know, 20, 30 years. It, it never goes to seed. Um, I'm not sure about the genetics with it. Why I, we just don't, it doesn't go into seed here in the US. If you go to the Caribbean islands, um, I'm trying to think which one, uh, maybe it's Puerto Rico or, I think it's Puerto Rico. You'll see them Martin. 10, 15 feet tall. Uh, we don't use this. A lot of them. What now? It, um, everything yeah. right? Yeah, it's St. Martin has a lot of them. Say St. Martin, yeah. And it, what we do is we, we don't use this particular plant for egg laying. We'll switch it over from a, you know, more of a native plant, a, a softer leaf. This is a pretty, pretty hard leaf, but it's a great little plant there. Um, yeah, and if you're doing cuttings, yeah, this one can be kind of difficult, but uh, you, you, you clip, you know, just get two leaves. That's it, two leaves, cut, cut, the type off, cut the top off, and you know, make sure you have a node, and you make sure you water it the uh, first time uh, really well, and you don't water it again for about five days. Make sure it's damp, but don't water it again, and then you're, you'll have success, okay? Okay, this is um, the buckeye butterfly. This is rib grass. It, it, this, this comes from Colorado, this uh, plant. Um, this is not, this is, this is really low egg laying here. I mean, normally I'll see probably 
100, 200 eggs here. It's just in a cup, it's a cutting. Uh, well, this picture, the reason this leaf has wilted, it was in the greenhouse. When heat was so high that it bent over, it's okay, it's very, very important on the uh, buckeye or any, any uh, species for that matter. The leaf has to be young, I mean, fresh. It can't be an old leaf. It just won't work. So uh, there you go. There's the buckeye right there. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a great butterfly, um, very colorful. And of course the eyes all over it, you know, to stop the predators, but they still come in there and get them. Um, uh, yeah, we, we rib grass uh, from, from, the, from Colorado does go dormant. It goes to seed in, um, I believe that was June. And then you, the only way, if, if it goes to seed, you're gonna lose a plant. So we, we'll cut it way back and, and then try and start it over or, you know, give it another month or just start planting, replanting new plants. Um, raise a lot of those butterflies. Yeah. There's just some, some dwarf pentas there. Pentas, porterweed, uh, antenna, jatrophia. Those are some of the species of plants we use for nectar, firebush. Swallowtails love this, uh, especially giant swallowtail, spicebush swallowtail. Yes, they like that. Uh, next. Okay, these are malachites, and um, this is probably you know, some of those are fourth end star, getting maybe fifth end star. That's actually really yeah, right there. Um, they feed on brownie black. They lay their eggs on brownie black. This butterfly is in South Florida. Um, and if, if you're ever down there, way down there, you see a lot of mangoes. Well, the plant brownie black them is underneath the mangoes. And that's why that butterfly is, is there. It's more of a, a Central South America butterfly. And we do have it in Florida, obviously. Um, and I think in Texas too. It's a great butterfly. There it is right there. It's, it's uh, fruit fears. And this is, this is in general, um, you know, one of the ways we do the fruit. You have to, I mean, we got apples, bananas, uh, mangoes, and you see the slices in there so they can you know, get the nectar out of there. Bananas, I mean, the only way you can, it's really, really important that you, you give fresh bananas. If, if, the, if the second day the banana is covered, you just scrape it off, but you know, every, every two days we're, we're replacing. This, this can get rather expensive, um, but these guys have to have nectar. The, the interesting thing, one of the interesting things about the malachite, one is very long living. Uh, the chrysalis is beautiful. The, you can tell the male and female by the abdomen. If there's a little orange tip at the very end, that's a female. If it's solid white, it's the male. Um, like I said, they can then, uh, live a long time. However, their colors will tend to fade out. Great butterfly there. And you can see that, there you go. There's the apples. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of fun. Um, they kind of beat up there, but they, uh, trust me, some of these butterflies will live a long time. Yeah, that's good. You know, that does it. Okay, this is the brown and um, The shrimp plant, if you want to call it that. I really don't like this. Um, this particular picture of the egg laying because there's so many little leaves here and trust me, little spiders, you know, one little spider, just one little spider. If it's inside there and you don't, you miss it, it'll kill all the eggs, not just the eggs, caterpillars on this one, it will go around and kill all of them. So um, yeah, we, I guess we were out of the ones without, without the top there, but uh, Again, I mean, you can you know, make it work, but you have to rub the leaves, make sure that uh, no spiders are in there. Okay, next. Okay, this is inside, this is outdoor breeding. Uh, it's kind of hard to see in here, but there's a, up, up high, there's, you know, wire, and then there's a greenhouse. It's a cage inside a cage. Actually, it's a triple cage inside the cage. So, um, so there's a wire on top, and then the, the greenhouse, and then, this cage inside and individual cages. And if you really want to know why, it's because the number one predator we I've had, well, right, if it's not one, it's, it's, it's two, uh, the rat. And the rats are very, very, very smart. And once they figure out how to get in, they, they, they will, they'll eat the eggs, the caterpillars, the chrysalis, 
the butterflies, they'll eat seeds. Um, so the, the wire keeps them out. All of this, everything to the right over here is caterpillars. These are mainly malachites right there. The, the area to your left are our flight areas. And it's just, just, just different areas, different species in there. Um, we're always watching the sun. So the sun right now is uh, to the south. Um, so in the middle of sun, in the summer, the sun's you know straight above us. So when the sun is at an angle in the sun in the, in the uh, winter time, you know, basically from uh, November to you know end of February, and it starts moving up. You have to adjust your flight area. If you don't, you won't get that egg lane because the, the light won't be right. Um, these are little pop-ups, two feet by, I think three feet, two feet, really good, nice, nice little pop-ups. But I guarantee you if this was not protected, there would be a rat hole in each one of these, 100% sure. So, all right, next. Okay, this is, because um, we have a lot of different ways to grow plants. This is aquaponics. So let me show the kids this. So there's fish in there, there's tilapia, cleaner fish, and we have some goldfish that we went at the fair, the Kissimmee Fair every year uh, with the ping pong ball. It's one of the things I love to do with the grandchildren. Um, so they go, to the, they go to the bathroom and then that is funneled into a, um, a tank to separate the, the good and the bad stuff from, from the fish. And I think, there you go, there's a setup right there. So this, this was actually done 10 years ago by Rob Cruz, a good friend of mine, he worked at the farm. I say, he just did it and started with 50 tilapia. And now we have one big one, I think it's about seven pounds, six pounds, um, lots of goldfish. So the water goes, they, they eat the food, it goes up this tube right here, it's actually a hose into this tank. It's kind of cleaning out a little bit. And then it comes down and you can see the water coming down there. Um, that's mint right there. And there's nothing but rocks and then gravity, goes from there back in so it's flushing it out and all that good stuff but that's all that that plant's being fed 100 by the fish and you can see the pipes behind it um yeah there's a good picture right there the the pipes behind it are um hydroponics total water inside there eventually i'd like to to get a much bigger system to use that fertilizer fertilizer to feed all those, those plants in the pipes uh, but this is a lot of fun and it's fun to, uh, you know, the kids get a big kick out of it. Okay, next. There's just another set. Now all this stuff, you can see some yellow in there. We just built this uh, um, cage and my goodness, it was a lot of work. Um, the, the key to this is it's got to be level. If it's not level, it's not going to work. Um, that's Bacopa right there. And uh, there's, there's different names for it. But uh, that's the rays of butterfly called the white peacock. And uh, there it is right there. And all of this was just picked and, and uh, got, to, got it in there. Nice little flower. There's, there's a but great butterfly. Um, uh, keeps its wings open. Great for uh, taking pictures. That looks like a female right there. Um, you know, they, they eat a lot of food. And we've, that's, this butterfly, we probably raised more than any butterfly that we have at the farm. Uh, yeah, and sometimes they'll, they'll fly in groups and, and exhibit and puts on a great show. This is just some kunti for the tala. And, and again, you can see some of these pots where unfortunately uh, the larvae ate too much and I hopefully they'll come back, but we have to, it's, I mean, these are expensive plants. So we're growing our own now, but my goodness, they take to get to the size, all these have been eaten two, three, four, five times, but just to get the size of the middle one right there is probably from, from scratch, four years, five years maybe. So it's not something you can just rejuvenate real quick. Um, the rib grass is to your left for the Buckeye on a hydroponic, hydroponic system. Um, that, that, that right there, okay. Um, the containers, this is just a, a little setup to show you. Um, this is where we put the in, indoor breeding. So whatever species it is, you know, we'll put them in a, a, either a cup or a pot, go inside, and they have air, you know, on top, on the sides. Um, it, it, this is actually the feed stack right here. This picture is, this is, we have three stacks. So this one is the feed stack. And so it, it, they're all in one position at the beginning of the day. 
And so what we do is, you know, we go, we have three, three stations. And so we go, we look at each one. Does it need to be fed? Does there pupa to, you know, pick? Um, if it doesn't need to be touched, it's, it's passed through. If it needs to be addressed, then it goes in this middle pile. And then we, we got to feed it, either clean it out, this and that. Um, a lot of work. Um, but you get quick, you know, you move fast. And the more you, faster, the more you breed, the faster you get. But you, you, you have to be aware of smell, um, you know, the caterpillar, so many things can go wrong. You can tell by the way they crawl. Okay, we're using filters like there. This is, we have two of these types of filters here. This two inch filter on the outside, uh, has back filter in the back. And then it's all together, I think there's five filters in this, this room to take out the pathogens so the caterpillars won't get sick. Uh, the, the lights there to keep, you know, any kind of um, parasite might be coming in there uh, accidentally. It's endless. I mean, my goodness, uh, so many things can go wrong. Uh, I tell people it takes about three years to be, you know, okay, breeder, because you have to go through the seasons. Um, you know, you just have to, the first year you just learning is all you're doing. Second year. Okay. I saw that last year. Uh, we're going to try this. The third year you can see your results of what you tried the year before. So it takes about seven, eight years, you know, you, you're on your way and, uh, uh, to, to breed and, but you, to this day, I've been doing this 50 plus years. Every day is something new, a new problem. <laughs> Never ends. So it uh, keeps it interesting. Okay, this is Julia's. Um, the Julia's and the zebra longwings, they, they feed on passion vine. I believe this is, it's hard to tell because I've eaten so much. It's either incarnata. I don't think it's super rosa. Maybe it is super rosa. But the Julia's, you can see the spines on them. And the zebras are the same way. If a predator were to touch the spines, a little sap will come out and choke, choke the, the lizard or whatever. So they're pretty, you know, uh, tough caterpillars to survive in the wild. Uh, these are great, they great, great caterpillars. Um, they can irritate you a little bit on your skin, so you have to be kind of aware of that. Uh, you know, this we're getting ready to feed. This is in the feed sack, so it needs to be fed. A lot of this is going to come out uh, to to save the plant and start with a new uh, cutting or whatever. Okay, next. Yeah, this is, this is the uh, zebra long wing and so you can see the, the chrysalis on top. Um, and again, just like the Julius, that's actually bat wing by Flora, passion vine there, kind of looks like a bat. Um, there's several different species of, of the bat wing. Um, this is a little, looks to me like a little tougher leaf. If you have the real fragile leaf and you're doing cuttings, they, they just wilt so quick. Um, again, in, when you're breeding large numbers, there's always gonna be that batch of caterpillars that are first to emerge. And then you have the middle batch, that's your majority that do really well. And then you have these stragglers and those you gotta get rid of. They cause so many problems. Um, yeah, so this is this is a typical container. I would say by the next day, all those larvae you see will be on top. So, that would, you know, um, and we'll pick them. It takes a day to harden up. They emerge within eight days, nine days. So we have to to get ready to ship them uh, pretty quick. So the, the timing is uh, everything is dated. Um, so we know when you know when it formed and and how long it's going to, uh, you can, you can also tell I me mean, I've done it enough. Like, okay. So here are the nice white, white, uh, zebra long wings. You got a fresh, uh, chrysalis right there in the middle. Um, yeah, they're, they're eating the last meal, getting ready to form. Uh, and yeah, so we won't, we won't, we won't touch anything in there because if you go in there and pick these, these, these pupa up and you touch them, they're just going to melt right in your hands. You have to they'll open up because they're not hard enough. So you have to wait a day. Uh, yeah, that's Subarosa right there. Uh, okay, next. Okay, this is, um, it's actually a, looks like a, a female spice for swallowtail. And so I think there's three different, two different species of uh, pupa on here. There's the zebra swallowtail, and there's the uh, spice, for, spice for swallowtail. And that's microfiber right there. And for years and years and years, 
I sit there with a glue gun and <laughs> put the pupil on there and, you know, thinking this is the best way in the world. And, and one day, uh, Crystal, my manager, came and said, hey, got to try this, you know. <laughs> it's just microphone. You just touch it and it sticks right there. Can't do, can't do every species, but I'd say 90% of them. Um, yeah, this is, this is the way to go because you're not hurting the pupa and it's, it's just easy. Uh, yeah, so this is some malachites. Now, this is something, you know, I'm training the, the, the new breeders. Okay, so when you look at this, beautiful chrysalis. Now, in the wintertime, it's really difficult to raise a malachite because the temperature change. You know, one day is 80, one day is 50, you know, back and forth. You know, we breed these outdoors. So if you look at the bottom there, there's three pupa there. The one of the very bottom is okay, good. The one to the right, not gonna, he's not gonna make it. He's gone. One to the left is gonna merge the next day. So obviously, I can't ship that one. So all this stuff, you know, you, you, after a while, you, you do it, you know. But uh, we'll take that one, the one that's gonna merge, and we'll pop it out for ourselves. Um, you look, you look for any kind of. The rest of them look pretty good. Um, I wish their colors were a little smoother, but the temperature and stuff like that. Okay, next. Okay, this this is just a little screen. You know, we, we put them in pop ups, um, put them in coolers for for releases and stuff. These are kind of old and and you know, uh, yeah, these are going to go for release today. It we release you know, probably twice twice a week. Uh, if if you, if you it's all about eggs. So you can't have too many in there. If you have too many in there, not enough nectar, you're not going to get any eggs. So you got to like really you know, figure out how many you're going to put in there. Um, yeah. So you got white peacocks in there. You got buckeyes, Julia's, gray southern whites, and that 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 mix right there. Um, you can see the the females on the top up here. That's a Julia. Um, the males a little bit down here. Just one stripe. You see the double stripe there. So that's a female. And the, on the peacocks, usually the, the male is smaller than the female. Okay, next. This is just a world map we have in the office, um, a breeding area. We've had a lot of uh, conferences uh, at the farm. We've had four, four major ones. And so all the time we, we invite um, the guests, the breeders. These are some of the major players in, in the world that are breeders or exhibitors. In, in, the, in, the, in the world market for butterflies, the United States has the most exhibits. And you look at this area right here with, uh, you know, mainly, mainly, you know, North, you know, United States is breeding lots of butterflies. Then you got uh, Central America and South America. They're breeding um, probably, the, you know, great numbers of butterflies. Africa, it's more in the South here. Um, and then you come into uh, the Asian countries and they produce a lot, Philippines and stuff like that. So those are the three major, four major areas in the world that produce butterflies. United, United States has the most exhibits. My best guess, this all started in 19, I believe, uh, 81, uh, first butterfly exhibit in Malaysia. And Europe got the next set of um, uh, exhibits. I think they maxed out at about 80 uh, in the late 80s and 90s. The United States got the first one in 87 Butterfly World in Fort Lauderdale. Um, now I'd say there's a butterfly exhibit pretty much in every, every state. Um, but, the, but, but the other part of the world uh, is not so many. So, okay, next. This is just more people that come and visit. It's, it's fun to see, you know, and you, it's, it's tough to raise butterflies up here up north because their, their season is really short. So they're going to probably start breeding in June. Uh, you can't you can't do nothing unless you have a, a temperature control greenhouse and, and you're willing to go that route with lights and all that stuff. Otherwise, you're you're going to have a hard time. Uh, okay, next. Okay, this is the cleaning station. Uh, this is. Has to be done is very, very important. You can see the layers of cups, lids, everything's recycled, everything's bleached. And I, I tell people, I said, it's just like when you go in the kitchen. Okay, so our, the screen's being bleached down here. We use a insecticidal soap for these. But if a cup is in a container and there's an infection in there and you don't clean that cup and you put it back in another 
container, you're going to have problems. So this has to be bleached, cleaned out all the time. And it's a lot of work. That's a sink right there. We use a three system, just like, like a bar. Yeah. Well, very, very important. And we'll soak the lids, the cups for, for a day or so. This is a fun spot on the farm uh, for the kids to see. Uh, it's old bird flight area. Uh, we have finches, uh, doves, beautiful little doves right there. The eyes are just wonderful. And uh, yeah, they, they never stop. <laughs> they, they keep going, there's the lovebirds. Uh, beautiful birds. Uh, unfortunately, our parakeets are in love with the, the lovebirds instead of <laughs> hanging out with themselves. Uh, yeah, that's been, been fun. We've had a rabbit. We have the tortoise in there and the turtle. Just trying to show the, the kids the difference between a turtle and a tortoise. It's a little tram ride we use. Uh, mainly take that in my backyard. Just to, We have a little, I have a food forest in the backyard and uh, butterfly rainforest in a bug area. Uh, campground and uh, you know everybody likes to take a ride so uh, that's a, that's a good time there it's a eagle's nest you know this is this is kind of a strange story uh, that tree was about 15 feet closer to the where the picture was taken when Irma came it kind of knocked it over and then over time it's just it was, you couldn't even drive down there's an easement right there so we, we had you know we had to cut it and so we moved it over there and, and make an eagle's nest and the tree, the stump to the left went on top of that. So that's an average size, uh, Larry, I think, uh, eagle's nest. This is four, uh, six feet wide, but it's only about two feet tall. Uh, uh, Larry knows way more about eagles than I do. But um, if you want to comment on, on size, Larry, uh, jump in on that. Well, the, the, eagles, the eagle's nest can actually be, you know, much deeper than that. Um, we have an eagle's nest uh, in Kissimmee um, at uh, Highlands Elementary, and it's been there a number of years, and it's easily, you know, three or four feet deep. Um, adult eagle, two adult eagles can be inside the nest, and you might not see them. So th they're even deep, you know, over time they get deeper and deeper. So this would be like a first or second year's eagle nest, probably. And that's an osprey nest on the left, I guess. Yeah, I was just, it, and I, I understand that the osprey sometimes will steal from me, take over the eagle's nest. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't know. Great horned owls definitely will because they're big enough, but I don't know if the osprey, if the, okay. the ospreys can't, can, can't fend off an eagle. So um, I've okay. never heard of an osprey stealing an eagle's nest, but uh, definitely great horned owls do. Okay, okay, good to know. Anyway, it's, it's fun. We can put three kids up there and, you know, they, it's a, just a different feel. And uh, we actually have a, uh, as Larry knows, we have a, a live eagle's nest nearby. So um, it's kind of neat. Yeah. And you're going to see one of the eagles in a minute. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now this looks really rough. We had a hard freeze. I wish this picture was taken a couple of weeks ago, but you know, the frost, I mean, we had first freeze we've had in four years and there's a row of bananas back there. A little story behind this, this area right there. So we've had the farm for, oh my gosh, this area, I think 25 years. So if you have a nursery and your pots, you know, plant dies, you, you, have, to, you have to dump the soil somewhere. So I was dumping it here. And over time, you, you know, it, it became like I, um, <laughs> A wonderful place for plants to grow and that papaya that, that tall papaya you see right there um it it popped up i didn't plant it actually that's 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 lady you know that's uh yeah that's the one right there is that lady red red lady i'm not sure but one popped up about 20 feet no that's the red lady right there the one to your right is about 20 feet tall and i'm like oh my goodness and so we started planting uh, the uh, fruit trees and boy, I mean, always, always the picture was taken two weeks ago, but I can't get it, but uh, it all come back. Um, so we're trying to make a food forest fence uh, is what our goal here is and not waste any of, of the, uh, the pots and, and the soil and stuff like that. This, this is just, um, we show raised bed method, barrel method, 
in all different ways, organic, you know, for the kids to see. Good picture, Larry. Um, that's the eagle. And I have to ask you a question, uh, Larry, on this, because today I was out there. I did get to see inside the nest. It, it didn't. Now, last year, both of the eagles had white heads. This one had a dark head. I don't think it was the baby. Uh, it was It was the baby. It was. Wow, that thing grew fast. My yeah. Goodness. You know, when I was there uh, a week and a half ago, it was all it was all dark colored, you know, modeled a little bit, but I was sitting on the side of the nest and um, I saw one baby, you know, about a week and a half ago when yeah. I was there. And this, this is the adult. Now the adults won't let a juvenile back to their, in the area when they're breeding. So it, I don't think it could have been another adult, like a, couldn't have been a young adult that was raised previously that's been flying. Um, so it had, had to be one of the babies that hasn't fledged yet, or it's just starting to fledge. So the same male and female go back to the nest every year. In general, yes, they, yeah. they try to, yeah. yeah. And they might even migrate up to New York or someplace in the summer and come back and then nest in the same place in, you know, right at exactly the same nest. Wow. Or they may stay in the area for the summer, it depends. Wow, okay. Yeah, I love that picture. Thank you for that. Sure. So this is uh, Professor Phineas Michelson's camp. Um, so it's a, just a little storyline behind it. Um, there's a gentleman named Mike Weissman who's helping with the conferences. And, and I want to honor him. And so uh, he came up with this. It's a, it's a camp for insects, so uh, implants and stuff like that. And you go in, you're going to see some pictures of what's inside there. So next. Okay, that's the, the professor right there. <laughs> and he actually looks like that when he dresses up, um, but his facial um, expression is pretty much on key there. Um, a little bit about some of the, the specimens in there. Those butterflies are from Peru. Uh, the ones in the middle are morphos, probably the most famous butterflies in the world. There you go, great. Um, in most exhibits, uh, you know, this is this is really done well. Um, I didn't I didn't do this. Uh, this is this is I bought this. But most exhibits, when you see a dead display like this, they don't even attempt to put the uh, antennas on because, I mean, think about it. You have every one of these butterflies. If one antenna breaks, yeah, it's not good. But literally every antenna is on there. A high high five to whoever did this. And you can you can always see the what what you want to look for when you look for a good good spread. Do I need to like, can you see my arrow right here or not? What's that? Can you see the arrow I'm pointing right now? No, I can't. Okay, I'll just use my finger. Can you, can you, you go see to this the, one? Can you see this? Yes. If you go what? in between the two wings on this morpho right below that. This one? Yeah. And go to your right. Yeah. And go right in the middle of the wings. Go a little bit to your left. This one or right no, here? This, yeah, that one right there. And just move over just a little bit to your right. Yeah. Okay, right there. There's a gap between the bottom wing and the top wing. That same gap needs to be yeah, on right the other here. side. Okay, when you're spreading butterflies, you want that gap, this other gap over here, the gap in between the body all to be equal. Okay, I know it's really hard to do, especially if you come down, um, Larry, come down a little bit further, you'll see a butterfly, the Rudy dagger wing down here to your right. Now go right. Oh, the dagger wing. Uh, to your here? right, come up. Oh, uh, this one. That one. You can see it yeah. split right there, there. Yeah, That's right a here. great spread right there. Very, very good, yeah. That's with, between the forewing and hindwing. Yep, yep. Okay. And um, that's what you wanna try and do. And you want your antennas at an angle too, but that's, that's a really good spread there. Uh, yeah. Okay, next. Um, this is just a little you know, kind of the way I do it. I flip the butterflies over and, you know, you can do it any way you want. Beetles are, are, are you know, much more difficult to spread. Um, I think that underneath that bat there is a uh, scorpion. Each one of the legs have to be uh, spread uh, with, with a needle. Uh, it takes about 
with a butterfly, I think three days to harden up and then you can take it off. Um, a lot of times if your butterfly, if you buy them, you know, if you're buying them from around the world, they come in an envelope, a glassing envelope. And then what you do is you, you take a, uh, a sponge, you put, you know, wet sponge, you put tin foil over it because the wing, you know, everything's hard, you know, so how do you open it up? So you take a sponge, it's damp, not, not dripping wet, but damp, put tin foil over it and you lay that, that glassing uh, envelope on there, cover it in a container, wait uh, probably a day, and then you'll be able to open the butterfly up and be able to spread it. Now your beetles, it's a whole nother ball game. Like that's a rhinoceros beetle. They're coming and they're, they're like a rock. So you literally have to boil them for 10 minutes to open up the wings. And they're, I mean, if you ever open one of those up, it's really neat how those wings pop out. It, they, don't, they don't go straight like that. It, fold, it folds in to get underneath there. So that's pretty cool. Okay, next. It's just uh, that bat that's in the middle um, is the same bat on top, just to show the kids, you know, this, it can be really small when it folds up. That's a whip spider underneath there. Okay, next. So bug cake, catch a bug, we cook it. So I kind of took the fishing thing where catch a fish, we'll cook it, so catch a bug. But um, the one major, in, in the world, just, just so you know, there's 2 billion people that eat insects every day. They're high in protein, low in fat. Um, in the United States, we're way, way behind on this, but uh, uh, Audubon Institute is, has a kitchen uh, for, for insects, you know, eating insects. And when we had the uh, conference in 2019, I think we had 20, 20 countries and um, they came in um, and served some of their, their, the food that they have in a restaurant. That was a lot of fun. Uh, one of their main items that they, they serve is um, they take, catch a dragonfly and they batter it, uh, egg wash batter, flour and deep fry it and they eat that. Um, if you ever eaten potato chips, you know, and eat a lot of them, you get bloated. But if you eat like little baby scorpions or mealworms or crickets, it, it just, it doesn't happen. You, you can eat a lot. That's a rhinoceros beetle right there. That's a typical dish in Asia right there. Um, you know, lots of vegetables, rice, and rice, rice. Now that scorpion, you know, they do, they serve a lot like that. But the ones I eat are much, much smaller. Um, very tasty, got a good kick to it. Also you can eat black ants. Uh, Instead of pepper, doing pepper. Okay, this is this is Ernesto. Uh, he lives in Costa Rica. He's one of the best uh, nighttime collectors, uh, you know, anywhere. Uh, so he's on the side of a mountain during a new moon, and you can see the sheet he has up there. And you see a slice. There's three slices in the sheet to the left, in the middle, to the right. And he does that to allow the air, come. if it's a windy night and that thing is solid, it's going to flip over. And he has it tied from the ends, okay? Now, there's actually four lights on this setup. The two in the middle are very bright, are 1,000 watt mercury vapor lights, which is crazy. I mean, that's a lot of light. And then he uses the black light on each side. So this picture, you know, I believe was taken around nine o'clock and then when it's on fire, I mean, it, 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 it's crazy. A lot of times a praying mantis will be on the top corners of each sheet on, on the ends. And it just seemed to know all the insects that come up there and they'll, they'll pick them off. The sheet on the bottom, you always put a sheet on, on the very bottom because a lot of times the insects um, will fly, the moths and beetles will fly and land on the, on the sheet. And you don't want to step on a really good specimen. Um, he mainly does this for show for the kids and, and adults. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, hopefully we're going to try and do it to, at our farm this year. I'm looking forward to it. And he, uh, I think he's going to come. So that'd be great. Uh, this is, um, this is a uh, Wayne Willing, our USDA inspector. Uh, just so he'd been our inspector, I think, for, oh my gosh, 30 years, whatever. Um, uh, just a little fun, fun exhibit. Kids, you know, obviously come in. They have no idea what, what the typewriter is and stuff like that. Um, yeah, we had fun with that. He's a good guy, very good guy. It's a little set up there, a little antique stuff, you know. Yeah. 
it would be nice to hook up the web uh, <laughs> telescope on it. Uh, this is just a little uh, facts about bugs. Now this was this was done, I, th I believe, five years ago. But these are the stats that I got. Um, did you know that bugs not only outnumber humans, but they outweigh us too? Seventy pounds of bugs uh, to one pound of human. Three hundred million bugs per human. Um, they're pollinators, food feeders for lots and lots of animals. Uh, very, very important that we have uh, insects. This is some of the conferences that we had. This one is uh, the 2019. We had 20 uh, different countries. These are, are the some of the, the, the you know major exhibitors and, and breeders from around the world. Um, we try to get together every two years in a different location. Uh, some of the other conferences we've had have been Ecuador, um, Costa Rica, Germany, Italy, uh, South Africa, Canada. Those are some of the places that come right off the top of my head there, but it's a really good group. Usually you meet together for about three days and there'll be lectures and stuff like that. But the real fun starts after that. You go on an expedition you know, to see the breeders lay out and all these different farms and really get to know and, and make friends for a lifetime. Uh, and so it's, it's good, it's a lot of fun. There's two, two, there's actually two associations here. There's International Association for Butterflies Exhibitors and Suppliers. Then you got the Butterfly Breeders uh, Association and that's from the United States. So anyway, a little bit about that. Okay, next. That's just an overview of the, and you, one thing about that, Sometimes when people see that sign, they get so scared. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. There's another zebra there. I guess, is this it? Or, okay. This is it. Okay. So anyway, that's pretty much the farm and uh, hope you enjoyed it. And thanks Larry and uh, Stephanie for letting me share all that. And if you have any questions, uh, try and answer. Yes, great. Thank you so much, Dan. You just have this fun little spot with so much going on. So I really appreciate you doing this service, uh, helping the, the plants and the, the butterflies and everything. It's really good what you do. Well, thank you. Uh, enjoy it. It's, it's yes. been a good ride. It's been a good ride. <laughs> Good. Now I do have a few questions. I have uh, Roz, Rosalind in the chat. Uh, she asked, you talked about long living butterflies. How long do they live? The longest lived ones live and what's short. So what's the shortest well, living? On average, it's, it's about two weeks. Okay. On average. Now species like the monarch obviously can live four or five months when they're migrating. Um, this particular species, the zebra longwing, you know, can live up three three weeks or four. Malachites have had them live two three months, um, but in general, two weeks. The butterflies that live a week, I'm trying to think. Um, usually, we we get more than a week out of. I can't I can't think of anything off offhand that uh, now the moths are different. They they a week is pretty good. So, and they take longer to breed too. So, yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, I have another one. Uh, just listening to this whole thing, it made me realize, how did you start getting interested in butterflies? Was this a lifelong passion or did some something happen when you were younger that uh, drew, drew you towards uh, butterflies? Okay, good and question. Um, I had two, two people actually um, got me going on this and it pretty much all started in first grade. My first grade teacher, Ms. Bumgarner in Miami, uh, she raised the monarch butterfly. And that was like the most incredible thing I've ever seen. And at the end of, of that period, I asked her if I could take that um, plant home and raise the monarch butterfly. And boy, I stuck with that for a long time, still doing it. Um, and then my neighbor, um, Richard Simpson, um, he, uh, had a collection of butterflies at the same time. So between those two, um, started, started raising the butterflies uh, all through elementary school, junior high. And then, you know, kind of got away from it in, in college. But I think it was 1987. Uh, it was, um, I knew I wanted to do something different. And my cousin for Christmas gave me a butterfly book. They knew I liked butterflies. And it was one of those things I opened it up and 
at that time, there were no butterfly exhibits in the United States. And I um, went ahead and proposed um, a small butterfly fly area, like, like a gazebo. And by chance, uh, I went to Cy the Cypress Gardens, um, asked me to come over there. And uh, the, the first interview was in the, the, the president's office and he's looking over their, their area. I had no idea they were going to uh, build one, but um, I didn't get the job, but I got to, they bought butterflies uh, from me. So that's how that, that all evolved. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, another question. There was a lot of info in there, but something stood out to me. You talked about the different groups of caterpillars emerge. There's the early ones, then most are in the middle, and then the last ones are like stragglers. Uh, and you said those are destructive and you get rid of them. What makes them so destructive, that third wave that's coming out or the, the last ones? They're gonna cause they're gonna cause a lot of problems. They're they're not gonna make most of them are not gonna make it. They gotta eat food that you need. Um, they can make the other ones sick. It's just not good. It's it's like the survival of, of the fittest in a while, you know. Um, unfortunately, that's just part of life. And that back that back group. Um, I mean, you could have a caterpillar, a larvae um, that's almost two inches, and you could have a larvae in the same container that's a quarter of an inch. It's not going to make it. It's it's it's, it's bad. So you got to get rid of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this might this might be a hard question, but do you have a favorite butterfly? Like, can you just pick one? <laughs> Well, if I if I had, if I could only pick one, and I'd have to pick, pick the Ulysses butterfly from Australia, um, incredible butterfly. It's like the Morpho, but it has tails and it has a black outline around the perimeter. Now I've seen it only uh, one time, and that was in Key West uh, Conservatory. Uh, Sam Trophy, who is the owner uh, of that, had it flying in there. It's very difficult to raise. But if out of the thousand plus butterflies that were flying in there, there's no doubt that was the showpiece for everybody. It just incredible butterfly. Yeah. Right? And bird wings would be a strong, there's bird wings can get up to 11 inches, you know, so yeah, most of them jump nine, 10 inches. They're, they're good. There's a lot of good ones, but if I had, I can pick one. Be yes. Okay. Great. Um, uh, I love your little displays that you have around uh, your place. And so what are the children's reactions in general when they see the bug collections, when they see the mannequins, uh, are they scared or are they excited? Well, you know, learn over the years that you never show everything all at once. You, you build it up, you always hide things and then you surprise them and every turn's a new adventure. Um, you got to keep young ones. You got to keep them moving. It's normally second graders. Uh, there's a lot to see. They, you know, we, we do, we sm let them smell the leaves uh, because some of the plants have a, a distinct odor um, touching, um, but mainly you, you keep them, keep them moving, keep it excited. Um, a lot of hands on. Uh, we, at the end now, um, we're actually having the children uh, get to plant a seed. So that's, that's good. They get to see the whole process. Uh, they're excited. The bug campground, they get, they get crazy. Um, and I will tell you this, um, you know, I have to get permission, you know, if they want to eat a bug but, and, and they'll do it, but they're all scared. They're all scared to eat a bug. But once the first child eats a bug and gets that sticker says, I ate a bug, a butterfly dance, you know, that they all want to do it. You know? So, and then you go back to school. Yeah. I ate a bug, I ate a bug. But it's just a little, you know, mealworm or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of that, what would you say is the tastiest bug? I like the scorpions. Uh, it just, they got a little kick to it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. And if anyone does come visit, is that a, a feature that anyone can participate in? Well, with uh, COVID and all that, I, I kind of put mm -hmm. a stop to that. But um, there's... You know, I'm sure we're going to open it back up. It's just a matter of time before you see uh, a bug restaurant. It's just a matter of time. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure it'll be a big hit. Uh, yeah, I'd like to do that. Um, the, on the farm, um, 
we have to make reservations. I can't have people just coming all the time. Um, it's a, it's a working farm. I do the tours just, just for, to, to, for fun and education. We really don't make a lot of money on that at all. Um, so it's, it's mainly for the kids. You know, we, we t- try to do some schools and stuff like that, but right now we're just swamp. Um, it's not, we're not open seven days a week or anything like that to, to the public. It's, it's, by reservation only period there's no way that i can 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 do this with great i understand and so on our youtube description page i put your website and so if anyone is interested in setting up a group they can just contact you through the website yeah we have a um a contact page and and you can ask questions or this and that but a lot of information's on uh you know, if you're looking for specific information, you can check a lot of different sites that have has more information than we do. Yeah, you know. um, but I'll answer questions. Any question? Yeah, you know, I'll try to anyway. Okay, Larry, do you have any questions? Uh, no, not really. Um, thought it was a good good uh, presentation, Dan. Um, and. Uh, one thing, though, I, I've, I've heard that zebra longwings can, li- can live longer than just a few weeks because they can actually digest nectar. They can actually digest pollen uh, yeah. that they get from flowers. Most get, butterflies can only drink nectar. Right. They get the protein. Yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right. And you can see it on the proboscis. Yeah, they, they, yeah. They, it could be two months, but, you know, our, ours is so intense in there. I never sat down on the of the days, but, yeah, you're okay. probably right. Mm -hmm. I just thought of another question because you have so many different types of butterflies native butterflies do you notice a lot of uh, predators coming more birds or other things drawn towards your property because of that oh boy uh that's a that's a that's a dagger (laughs) right there man um in the wild they say if if a butterfly lays 100 eggs one will make it okay so you have ants birds wasps spiders lizards stink bugs wheel bugs earwigs rats all trying to kill it it's it's like a it's crazy it's crazy ants are i mean all of it um never ends um it's so intense that sometimes in the malachite cage okay again you know that i throw out little caterpillars right so or there'll be a caterpillar on a plant. And we take it out of the greenhouse. This is in the peak season now, okay? We're doing thousands of, of butterflies. We can take that potted plant with a caterpillar on it. I would say 30 seconds, there'll be a wasp on it and, and kill it. Absolutely, yeah. Wow. They'll, they'll, they'll know this, is, they'll know. <laughs> They're looking out for me. Uh, and the rats, yeah, I mean, they, they're so smart and they're relentless. Yeah. Um, and they eat the seeds of the milkweed. They eat the eggs, they eat the caterpillars, they eat the live butterflies. When they eat the live butterfly, they don't eat the wings, they eat the body. So you'll know it's a rat when you go in a cage and the wings are just laying there, but not the body. Yeah. Wow. I never thought about rats eating them. The squirrels will actually do that too. Oh. Probably, yeah. I didn't even think about squirrels. You have squirrels, and oh my god, no, it's um, that's that's the biggest challenge is trying. Well, that and trying to have enough plants. Um, it's just endless, endless. endless. But... Wow. <laughs> did, did we mention that uh, the zebra longwing is the state butterfly? No, um, but it is, and I think um. Walken Lawton's, uh, he used to be our governor back in the 60s or early 70s. His wife, I believe, is the one that got that to be our state butterfly. I could be wrong, but I think that's the story I heard. So Lawton Child's wife? Yeah, his wife. Lawton Child's walked from uh, Panama all the way down to Miami when he's trying to be governor. Yeah, that's, that's what they call him, Walken Lawton. Little history. Awesome. <laughs> 
Well, thank you so much, Dan. Sorry for, sorry for the mess up at the beginning. I'm blaming oh, it on my daughter. <laughs> no <laughs> problem. Uh, I'm just so happy to have you here. And I was listening to it again. You can hear what I'm talking about, then a little echo in the background. So mm -hmm. anyone that does watch this, uh, they'll hear what I'm saying. And when I did start introducing you, that part is clear. No okay. echo. Okay. So all good. Uh, this is... Uh, Different than meeting one on one, but it's uh, a lot of fun. And thanks again, Larry and yeah. Yes, thank you, Larry, for uh, going on over and helping set up the PowerPoint. Uh, I appreciate uh, both of you for what you do, and have a wonderful yeah, week. Thank you, <laughs> and good luck with everything with the season kicking off, Dan. Uh, I wish you the best of luck this uh, season. And anyone that wants to check more out of Dan's farm, uh, you could check out the website, butterflydance.com. Yeah. And have a lovely evening, everyone, and stay safe. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. 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 <laughs>